But you just go into the booth for half an hour and go, <laughs> and then you're like, I went to college. This yeah. is a job? How is this a job? <laughs> the acting world, the artist world is all about how many side hustles do you have? Making our own short films with friends, mm -hmm. getting the improv comedians together and coming up with ideas and shooting shorts. Mm -hmm. That's how it all started. With a relatively low budget, we had two weeks. We had really no crew. Wardrobe was whatever people wore to set that day. Working in an actual working office that we were borrowing, so we just had to be quiet when people were on the phone and wait for their phone call to end. Nice. Now we're shooting in multiple, you know, three different countries. We're shooting in castles, things blowing up. We have armorers on the set. Today he gets to get chased down by running Europol agents with machine guns. It's, it's, it's gotten out of control. The U.S. is such a bubble. In Europe, you have so much more awareness of other cultures because you're right next to them. Yeah. But, you know, I can drive 900 miles and barely hear a detectable change in accent. Like, oh, how America sees America and how the world sees America are very different. And as a 17 year old, I mean, I thought I was a yeah. citizen of the world. People will look at me walking down the street. They're like, oh, that's an American. No, and I mean, I'm like, like well, I got good shoes. I got a cool <laughs> shirt. Why do you? And they're like, no, it's just something about they can tell you're an American. <laughs> Voicing anime was just another side job. Another, you know, it was 50 bucks an hour, no residuals. You'd go in and you'd record five things in a day. And then at one point he has this massive battle, goes up and has the full superhero, like yeah. lands in the middle of the arena, yeah. punches the ground and just looks up and goes, Kuma. I almost don't know people who talk like this because this is, is this very, very good. Write something bad mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. Sit down, start writing it. Mm -hmm. If it's a, is it a book, is it a screenplay, is it a novel? I don't know, start writing it and write something terrible. Hi, I'm Andrea Rogozin and this is Beyond Real Talk, a podcast where I invite real entertainment industry professionals and ask them real questions. What are they actually doing? How are they doing it? Why and how can you start doing the same thing? And my today's guest is an American actor, voice actor, writer, producer, and director. With almost 300 credits on IMDb, he worked on hundreds of voiceovers for English version anime and video games. He's also a writer of streaming series, The Inside Man, where I play the part Volkov. And today we are in Birmingham. We're actually at our unit base uh, and we uh, preparing for the last day of shoot in here in Birmingham. Rob McCall. Hi, Rob. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. I'm very Thank excited. You. Thank you for it getting... It is the last day. We've been here five <laughs> weeks. Yeah. Five weeks. What? You've been I'm here five very weeks. So I've been here two days. He's been here two days. <laughs> <laughs> All right, look. Um, we don't have enough, like a lot of time because uh, very soon you have your call time. I have my call time at mm -hmm. five. Uh, but what I want to start with, I want to talk to you about acting, about entertainment business, why you got into it, how you <laughs> got into it. Let's start from the very beginning. Uh, you are from the US, from the That's United right. States of America, uh, from Texas. Mm, that is true. Yeah. Dallas, Texas. Da are you, were you born in Dallas? Or I grew up in Arkansas yeah. and then I've been in Dallas since I got out of university. Yeah. So very important question. The first very important question. Why is it Arkansas, not Arkansas? <laughs> no idea. It, it has to do with the, the Native Americans. Of the, the real question is, yeah. Arkansas is correct. Why yeah. is it not Kansas instead of yeah. Kansas? Because okay. that's obviously the right way to say it. <laughs> All right. So look, uh, can you tell me a little bit about like how you grew up? In the, because for me, uh, and I, I uh, recorded an episode yesterday with Brandon Potter, and we talked a little bit about it. So I am from Eastern Europe. All I know about America is that alien, aliens attack New York and Washington first, always. Always happens in films. But I don't know much about, you know, like smaller America because you're not from the huge city, right? Or right, yeah, I grew up in a small town in Arkansas, about 6,000 people mm -hmm. when I was growing up. So How was uh, went to the, the same school all the way through, lived in the same house from mm -hmm. the time I was one until I graduated high mm -hmm. school and went to university. So got a very small town. Uh, Arkansas, rural and slightly yeah. southern. Although the one difference is Walmart, yeah, the giant corporation. And I think is it's one of the biggest. Yeah, like, kind of like is the, based in Bentonville, which is the small yeah. town I grew up in. So when I started, it was just like a company, and yeah. then by the time I grew up, it was like everyone in the town so worked it's, for that. So it's the only so source like, of jobs, probably. Exactly. Right now, yeah? So it's like you grew up in the I call it in the shadow of the beast because mm. everybody either works there or is in some way dependent upon them for mm. their living. But we were not. My family, my dad was an attorney. We weren't part of the Walmart mm. world. But just seeing that 
behemoth yeah. grow was kind of fascinating. And that kind of got me interested in business and the business world. Mm -hmm. So that's how I started long before my desire to be an artist mm -hmm. came. I started wanting to be a, a business guy in sales and marketing. All right. And so that's what I studied at university. I was always doing theater uh, in, in school mm. and in community theater productions, and, but never thought of it as a career that anyone could have. Like yeah. in Arkansas, you don't see that. You think that's the thing people in LA and New York do, but nobody else in the world yeah. gets to be in the arts. Yeah. And so it wasn't, how? wasn't until I moved to Dallas. After college, okay. moved in as a sales and marketing person and met a bunch of actors in Dallas. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, what do you mean you're an actor yeah. in Dallas? Yeah. Like, like you, can, you can make a living <laughs> here doing that? Yeah. And that's when I found out about all the corporate and commercial mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of voiceover in Dallas because there's a lot of ad agencies there. So mm -hmm. even if they shoot the commercial in New York or Toronto or anywhere, they do the post-production where the ad agency is. Oh, okay. So there's a lot yeah. of voiceover work there. And started asking around and was like, I. I think that sounds more fun than what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. How would I do that? And so started making some friends and acquaintances and kind of just decided to do it as a hobby to see if anything happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the early casting directors that I went in front of were like, yeah, you, you, you got something, but you, you need some training. You should take mm -hmm. some improv comedy. Mm -hmm. That's what all the commercials wanted at that time yeah. is improv, funny, off the cuff guys. Yeah. And I was a writer for corporate stuff. So I was like, okay and started taking improv comedy. And then that's when it hit that like, oh, this is, this is what I wanna do. Mm -hmm. I wanna be performing. Mm -hmm. And spent the next two years working my way out of the real job and into doing commercial and voiceover work. How did you do it? <laughs> <laughs> well, again, luckily being in Dallas, there's a big voiceover yeah. hub. Yeah. Um, I, I went on an audition for my first commercial. It was a national commercial for Southwest Airlines. I did, th I did this. Thank you. And scene. And I'm like, oh, this is easy. This is going to be great. If that's all you have to do to make money, I can yeah. walk across screens. And then, of course, didn't yeah. book anything else for the next three years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but luckily started getting into to voiceover and commercial, like, come into Dairy Queen for two ninety nine dollars off your Dairy Buster, that, that kind of thing. Yeah. And that's where it started. And that's when I was able to add the voiceover piece to trying to do on camera and commercial stuff, that's where the ability to actually make it a, a mm -hmm. full-time career mm -hmm. happened. Nice. And so, so that was phase one yeah. of many yeah. phases. And uh, <laughs> what was phase two then? <laughs> well, I the, started booking a lot of uh, like corporate videos where I was the host. Mm -hmm. Like, welcome to your 1999 training video to mm -hmm. explain how to do these things. Mm -hmm. And I was changing the script on the fly to yeah. try to make it better. To fix it. Some writers might not like it. Well, to be fair. a lot of corporate stuff is just like, it looks good on the page. Yeah. It's straight from their training manual, yeah, but yeah, it's not yeah, a thing yeah. a human being yeah, would say. People don't talk like that. And so the director started to know like, oh, we can't, we don't have time or effort or, or people to fix this script. But if we just hire Rob, he'll fix it on the fly. Mm -hmm. And after time, a couple of them said, hey, would you just write this script for us. Yeah, but That's how I got into the writing was because I was as an actor fixing it yeah. and they didn't mind. Yeah. I was like, is this gonna get me fired or is this, and they're like, oh no, keep doing it, fix it. Yeah. And, then, and then someone asked me to write mm -hmm. uh, a script for them that I wasn't in. Mm -hmm. And so then I started again, side hustle number yeah. two. The acting world, the artist world is all about how many side hustles do you have? Yeah. You have a, as you know, a podcast, you're acting, you're voiceover, you're doing on camera, you're also being a production assistant for somebody else mm -hmm. and putting all those things together. But eventually the writing started to be another, yet another stream. Yeah, but like, but, but you said that you worked as a writer also like as a like corporate writer as well. Yeah. So you, you were like a copywriter. How did, did that happen? Is it something that you kind of got education for or how? Well, I, I had a sales and marketing degree. And mm -hmm. so when you, and I got a job as a sales manager, so writing copy for, Mm -hmm. you know, advertisements or the yeah. online things, it kind of came as part of that job. Which is very different from actual writing, very I think, different. you know, from script writing, because yeah. you are a writer and an actor on the inside man. So, but, I mean, it's, you should, <laughs> you know, it's different. <laughs> it was a very long journey to get yeah. to put, and really it was just a journey to trust myself that I wanted to, I always had the desire to do it, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then finally started letting myself do it, making our own short films with friends, mm -hmm. getting the improv comedians together and coming up with ideas and then shooting shorts. Mm -hmm. That's how it all started. And then 
this weird convergence of meeting Jim Shields, who's with mm -hmm. Twist and Shout, who's mm -hmm. making corporate videos, but he wanted them to be actually funny and actually interesting. Yeah, yeah. And working with him and saying like, okay, how do we take the boring pieces of the, that we're required to say mm -hmm. and work it into something that's actually and interesting and entertaining yeah. and actually tell a narrative. Mm -hmm. And that was a 15 year journey of oh, working yeah. with him and building up to the point that now we're on this huge project that mm -hmm. you're a part of that's a six season, yeah. 12 episodes per season action adventure drama that happens to also be for a corporation about IT security. And that also, so like if we're talking about the, the, the inside man, which is yeah for, for IT security for no before company. Uh, and it also started much smaller, right? So oh, yeah. So like right now it's, it's a much bigger show, like in seasons probably what, four or five, you had helicopters and stuff. So now it's kind of, it get, it's getting bigger and bigger. So there is a lot of trust. And as I understand, it has a lot of awards. Uh, how how was his journey with the inside man? Well, Jim and I have been doing things like in the IT security land, like comedies and training videos and that sort of stuff. And No Before was a big company that wanted something for their training platform. Yeah. They have a training platform that has 500 videos on mm -hmm. it. And so we pitched them on this idea of like, hey, what if you made something different? What if you made something that felt like a TV series, that mm -hmm. felt like character-based drama that built yeah, over yeah, a season? Yeah. And it had learning moments in it that you could highlight after each episode, but they're woven into the script instead of just bullet points and training. Mm -hmm. And they took a chance with a relatively low budget. We had two weeks. We had really no crew. James, our producer, was the all of the art department. <laughs> <laughs> Wardrobe was whatever people wore to set that day. Um, we working in an actual working office that we were borrowing. So mm -hmm. we just had to be quiet when people were on the phone and yeah, wait for their yeah, phone call yeah. to end. So very different scope, but did that first one for them and mm -hmm. it took off. Mm -hmm. It got a huge amount of attention and a huge amount of press. And so they in turn bought our production company. Mm -hmm. They're just like, okay, you just work for us now. Yeah, We will have this. Mm -hmm. And season two is twice as long as uh, a yeah. shoot date That's and where, I appear where you came time. in yeah. and, and, and twice the budget. And then the next year was twice the budget of that. And the mm -hmm. next year was twice the budget of that. And it's continued to grow. Nice. Now we're shooting in multiple, you know, three different countries. We're shooting in castles. We're shooting in, you know, yeah. we have special effects. We have things blowing up. We have armorers on the set. Yeah. Today he gets to get chased down by running Europol agents with machine guns. It's, it's, it's gotten out of control. Basically, it's just, it's, it's to become a monster. How can people see it? Because every time when I talk about the inside man, when I, when I tell my friends about it, they're like, well, where, where we can see it? Like, well, you kind of can't. <laughs> you can see the trailers for every season. And each yeah. season has its own trailer and also behind the scenes film. Those are on the, uh, the inside man microsite if you just look up no before and inside man there's a site yeah. that has photos and stills and the season trailers but in terms of watching the actual episodes mm -hmm. you have to work for a company who subscribes to no before yeah uh there are about 18 no i think there's something like 25 million employees that could possibly yeah. see it across the world yeah, yeah, that yeah. subscribe to no before yeah um um, we demand. know about six million people have watched the entire series at this point. That's a lot. That's a lot of screens. My face being on, which is scary it's such sometimes. an attractive <laughs> face, though. It's so oh, chiseled. Stop. It's so good. Stop! Come on. Come yeah. <laughs> no. All right. Uh, so this is like, but as I understand, like right now, it's one of the biggest projects that you probably the, the biggest, biggest project, project by far. Yeah. Of. And I hope there will be more years in front of us uh, for all of this. Uh, but let's also talk about. Anime, because you voiced a lot of anime, like a lot. I, and I loved, and like when I was younger, I loved anime. Now, now I kind of just stopped watching for some reason, but I do still love anime. I do, like I remember, for me, anime was like, it's like Hollywood. Like there is a lot of crap, a lot of amazing stuff, and a lot of just great things. So, uh, is there any specifics how, like of, you know, being a voice, actor for anime or projects like that because you kind of and i i spoke to brendan about it as well like you probably sometimes need need to be really big and like just make those you know, <laughs> weird voices what was the specifics well the main thing to know is that that you cannot make a living as an anime voice actor no. as doing the dub like it is a it is a finished product from japan that we yeah. dub into english that pays almost nothing yeah. there's no residuals 
doesn't matter if your show is the number one show on Cartoon Network globally, yeah. you're not getting paid a dime for that. Oh, but come on. now, if you are lucky enough, as I have been, to be in it for a really long time mm. and do some of the really big shows, mm. you get invited to do conventions, you get invited to do autograph mm -hmm. signings. You now actually can kind of have that as your job. All but right. before, voicing anime was just another side job, another, mm. you know, it was... 50 bucks an hour, no residuals, you'd go in and you'd record five things in a day and you had no idea what they were for. You'd mm -hmm. go in and have five minutes to look at it. Yeah. The director would tell you what was happening. You're angry, you're mad at that guy, yell at him, <laughs> and you watch the Japanese and you match the mouth movements as close yeah. as you can and rework yeah. the script. So it never started out as being a big deal because nobody, A, anime was not large mm -hmm. 15 years ago, 20 years ago when mm -hmm. I started. And also the true fans only watch the Japanese. Yeah. You didn't care about the English dub. It was yeah. just something that had to be there <laughs> to sell the DVD. It had to have an English language track. Uh -huh. But as the market for anime grew and the fan base grew and more and more people started watching it streaming, mm -hmm. so they're watching it on a small screen, so reading the subtitles is hard, mm -hmm. or they're watching it while they're doing their homework, while they're doing yeah. their laundry, while they're ironing, suddenly the English dub became more and more prevalent. Mm -hmm. And now it's huge. Like for viewerships for a show like Attack on Titan... Uh, is massive. Yeah, uh, yeah. One Piece still, the show's been going on for 18 years, is still massive, mm. massive property. And and it was kind of just lucky enough to have lived in Dallas where mm. Funimation and now Crunchyroll was and, uh, and just be one of the guys who was around back then. And you'd walk in back in those days, it was like, okay, you're here today, okay, you're gonna be that guy mm. and you'll be yeah. that guy and also <laughs> that guy. Now there's... Yeah. 300 people that submit auditions every week to try to mm -hmm. get in and it's much more competitive than it used to be mm -hmm. um, but in the early days it was just right place right time yeah. it, and it, having the, the, the ear to listen to what the director is telling you to do and say okay this is this yeah. is what this needs to be and some of them are really poignant and real acting and you feel like you're in an indie film and some yeah. of them are just screaming at the top of your voice while things explode <laughs> uh, well, what would be the, the, the most ridiculous thing that you had to do as a voice over actor for anybody well, I was, it was ridiculous, but I also loved it. There was a character that I did that was a bear, and uh, their race is the Kuma, and so he would say the word Kuma after every sentence. So he's like, I think we should go here, Kuma. We, we should be there fine. We'll be fine, Kuma. I'm going to win this, Kuma. And then at one point, he has this massive battle, goes up and has the full superhero, like yeah. lands in the middle of the arena, yeah. punches the ground, and just looks up and goes, Kuma. <laughs> <laughs> Which you don't get to do that in everyday life. No, it just no. doesn't happen. But it sounded cool, even when you showed it right now. <laughs> it was, it was, it was pretty fun. Yeah. And also, I've gotten to do big, big, crazy monsters mm. that are just you just growl, and then they mm. affect it and pitch sift it down, so you have no idea what. But you just go into the booth for half an hour and go, <laughs> and then you're like, I went to college. This yeah. is a job. How is this a job? <laughs> I mean, look, it sounds fun. How long did it take you to find your I don't know, like to free your voice, to find these different voices in you, because I think it's kind of like regular person, when you tell them, like non-actor, tell them to say something, like read something, and usually it's just like robotic, like stuff. Right. Then when, when you kind of free up a little bit, you can use your own voice a little bit better, but then when you need to do something, I'm a goblin in this little cave, you know, all this like, oh, like how, how often uh, it happened for you that you like suddenly, like, Ooh, this is new voice I can do. Nice. Yeah, you find something new. <laughs> yeah. It does happen. Well, I, I will say one of the things that helps is that no one is watching you. Mm -hmm. You're kind of alone in the sound booth. The director's over there through the glass, but they're not really looking. So you don't feel as stupid as you mm -hmm. would if you were trying to do it on a stage in front of somebody. Yeah. Um, and there is a freedom of, of playing with the microphone, your mm -hmm. voice in the microphone and hearing what you can do. Yeah. Like, I have this microphone really close here. Yeah. I can go down and do yeah, bad guy right. voices like this and do this kind of thing. But if I'm talking, even the distance we're sitting right now, yeah. you wouldn't hear half the things I said yeah. across the table. Yeah. But if I'm right here mm -hmm. and the microphone is right here, you can do lots of bad guy evil things. And so it's just it's yeah. kind of having permission to play with that. Mm -hmm. First of all, you just have to be one of those kids that always did stupid cartoon voices, which I think <laughs> most actors were because we're all kind of ridiculous. But then just realizing that and having the chance, again, having having 15 years in the booth every mm -hmm. couple of weeks to go in and be playing with it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and the stuff I did was terrible mm -hmm. 20 years ago. Now I feel like I have control of my instrument and I know a little bit yeah. more what I'm doing, but I watch back some of those other stuff. It's just cringy. Also, because there was only a few people in doing it back yeah. then, like 
you were doing characters you should never be cast as, and I'm playing 12 year old kids, and I'm playing 70 year old men, and it's just me doing an old man voice. Now they actually just cast a 70 year old yeah, actor yeah. who's really good yeah. at doing that. But you listen to some of those old, like the Dragon Ball Z, old school, love it. It is one of the OG uh, titles, but some of that stuff is like the same actor's voice in four different characters in the same episode. <laughs> and you can actually hear it. Now, now they care a whole lot more. They hire really good directors, really good writers, and they make the English dub a standalone thing. But in the early days, mm -hmm. it was just an assembly line to get it done. Yeah, well, I mean, everything should start somewhere. Is there a shortage on some type of voices? Well, there's not a, enough diversity. Yeah. Uh, anime is now drawing a lot more diverse characters, mm -hmm. but there is not enough di diverse voice actors, mm. especially in Dallas, to do that. So, so that's always in demand. Um, 40-something white guys, there's plenty of those. There's, we're <laughs> broke out in those. They're everywhere. Um, disposable. But, uh, but, and then just, the, 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 one of the big things in anime is the young, is the young voice. That, that 14-year-old, 16-year-old mm -hmm. boy who strives to be a hero, mm -hmm. but you can't hire 16-year-olds. They have to be able to work and a right-to-work state and have a real job and do it for eight hours a day. Yeah. So that young hero, come on, we can do it. Let's go, guys. Like that, because <laughs> uh, so much of anime is that, is yeah, that yeah, character. Yeah. Um, that's the thing, you know, Brandon and I both love getting to do gravelly bad guys and of do course, down here. Yeah, of course, Brandon's, Brandon's gravel is way better than my gravel, but <laughs> those are more fun uh, to do. But, but that, young, that young hero voice is the thing that probably there's the most demand mm -hmm. for. Mm -hmm. um, and then females that can play young, young kids, mm -hmm. male and female. Yeah. There's a lot of work for that as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, I'm guessing there is not not uh, not a lot of work like that here. <laughs> I think maybe, maybe there's not there's not a lot in the UK right now. Although there's start, I know there's a couple of productions. There's yeah. there's more games, video games. Yeah. There are some some good strong UK companies that use UK voice talent, mm -hmm. and I think there's a couple of indie indie companies that are doing anime. But really, you know, Crunchyroll is one of the huge one of the largest ones. They kind of got a lock on the anime side. Yeah. But first run animation, I always tell people that's the way, that's where you want to be. You want to originate that character, mm -hmm. not just dub somebody else's performance. So yeah. finding those animators, even finding that friend that's doing a web, mm -hmm. a web comic mm -hmm. and saying, hey, do you need voices? I would love to come do that. Uh, no, you're not going to pay me, but just start getting the, the experience of it. That's yeah. the way. That's where you start nowadays. Yeah, maybe that's something I need to do because I, I'm, I'm planning to kind of like, I'm trying to get into voiceovers as well because I, I think there should be some kind of demand for, for evil bad Russians and some yeah, computer there's, games. I've heard so many bad American attempts at a, at a Russian or, or Ukrainian yeah. accent that so I, there's gotta be work out there. It's just finding, also because it's such a fast process. Like mm -hmm. they get it, they need someone mm -hmm. that week, they need someone Tuesday at five mm -hmm. o'clock and they'll find the best person they can who can be there Tuesday at five o'clock. <laughs> Not necessarily the best person yeah. in the world to do that, but there's gotta, there's gotta be a way. You know yeah. I love your voice. I've been casting it now for three years. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> he started as like a one episode bad guy, that, or two episode bad guy that only had one line. And I'm yeah. like, oh, we have to write him back yeah. in. We have to have Andre back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's so good to be back as well. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, because I, well, one of my experiences that I think one of the worst uh, dubbing that I've heard in video games it was Metro, and there were like, like there were a lot of Russian characters, and I was playing it in English actually. <laughs> right. The, the, yeah. <laughs> I was playing it in English weirdly for some reason, and they were like, and you could hear like, okay, this guy voices Russian guy, and he is actually Russian. I can hear that. And, and there are some guys that like they were just jumping from American to 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 kind of Russian ish, but like it's very very stereotypical Russian because it's the, sometimes I almost don't know people. Who talk like this because this is, is this very very good. <laughs> well, and that's because most Americans don't know a real Russian accent. Yeah. They know movies they've yeah. seen where other Americans are doing bad. Re so it's a copy of a copy of a copy. Yeah. We are talking like this, yeah, like and we go down at the end. We make a vowels very round in the back of our throats, <laughs> which we don't actually do. I know, <laughs> but yeah, I'm not saying it's good. I'm just saying it's prevalent. <laughs> no, but I mean, like I think I think it's more and more right now kind of like people actually start to care more and more about other cultures. To there really is a big push now and especially like you know the the 
getting someone that is actually the race of the character they are playing, getting someone that is actually of the country of origin of the character they're playing. They'll play with mm -hmm. accents and dialects more, but they, they used to just not worry about it at all. And now it's like, if I was to be sent an audition for a Native American person, I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I could maybe make my voice sound that way, but I'm not going to, yeah. I'm not going to do that. And that's, that's been in the last probably five or six years starting to become much more important in the industry and they're paying more attention to it, which is Yeah, good. yeah. I mean, like not always still, but sometimes like more, uh, I definitely know that it happens more and more, but like I still have some, I remember I was auditioning for some project for some big franchise and they needed a Russian speaking guy. And they actually, like I did the audition, they were interested, but in the end I'm watching the film and there is this guy who doesn't speak Russian he tries to say something in Russian, and I can't understand what he's saying. I only understand it because I auditioned for the role. You knew what the script was ahead <laughs> yeah, of time. Yeah, like yeah. really, this like, but why? There's two lines, and I'm not saying cast me, but there are like quite a few actors, Russian-speaking actors, who I know who actually also auditioned for it. They wouldn't ruin your film with a couple of lines, and there would be more authentic. Why don't you? Come on, <laughs> give us a chance. And I would think video games too would be a, a, an opportunity because there is a really strong video game presence in the UK yeah. and they're building more and they, what, some of the best video game design mm. university programs are in the UK. Mm. Um, and so I would think that, that that's a, a, a good place to dive in just because that's, that's, I think so. that's local and also they should care mm. about getting it right. They should mm. care. They should. Video <laughs> games are so much more fun mm. because you're, you're, you're recording the lines before they've animated. Mm -hmm. So you can you can set the character, you can build, and they're going to animate yeah. to you. And they'll give you a script, yeah. but basically it has to fit in this 1.5 second moment. Mm -hmm. So you can you read the script and then you offer them three or four other options. Yeah, like, yeah, oh, it could yeah. also be this, it could also be this. And then you have to sit and wait for the game to come out mm -hmm. and play it to see if any of your ad-lib lines mm -hmm. made it in. <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah. I know. Like, I, I had the... Uh, my friend on a podcast, uh, George Taylor, and he actually worked like his biggest project that he worked on. Uh, he worked on uh, Baldur's Gate Three, mm -hmm. which I, I like. I still haven't played it, but I've heard it's amazing. And like he, it's such a big project, and he worked like on one of the kind of like big-ish characters, not the main ones, but like he, he's pretty pretty prominent. Like, and he has a huge fan base now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you go to especially there's the characters like single character on Baldur's Gate will have a table at some of the anime conventions and yeah. go in and that that one thing, and they'll have a bigger line than I, me that's had you know 300 roles, and they're like, no, but that's that's <laughs> yeah. awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I don't I don't blame them. I think it's cool. Yeah, I've gotten to do a few a few fun g games that I really enjoyed, mm -hmm. and I would love to do more. So Wish if you're watching. Yeah. Hire him, but also hire me. <laughs> which, which, which games? Which games did you enjoy? Yeah, uh, I know Borderlands, Borderlands 2 Borderlands, yeah. was probably the biggest one. Yeah. Uh, there's another one called Orcs Must Die, mm -hmm. which wasn't as big, but was a really fun character that I got to do. And mm -hmm. then just because he was big and ridiculous. And yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, uh, uh, um, so I'm guessing no one would fly you in from, from Dallas here to, to voice. Probably not, because yeah. now we can do voiceover in, in booths remotely. Yeah, yeah. They, they have stopped doing that. In the, in the pandemic, everybody figured out how to do it remotely, and all mm -hmm. of us had home studios set yeah. out, and now a lot of the studios are like, no, we want you to come in, mm -hmm. um, which I think is more about them wanting to justify the rent that they're paying on their mm -hmm. buildings than it is the sound quality, <laughs> but uh, I could be wrong. <laughs> I could be wrong. But, uh, and they can, can have a director there as well. Yeah. And I have I have had helped some British friends get into some roles that needed British people and put them in touch with UK artists mm -hmm. and they would do a voice match and then they're like, can you make it more British? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, no, they are actually British. That's how they would say it. But like, so again, Americans just have a wrong idea of what British accents well, are. Well, I mean, that it's just in general, I think it's like Charlie Chaplin who who was like on the second place in the Charlie Chaplin impersonation uh, contest or something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like, it's you can't tell me that I I don't sound. Russian enough, and I had it actually. Like I, I think I, I did some audition for uh, the Bollywood film, and directing me was, was telling me like, I can do better Russian accent than you. Look, well, no, because that's <laughs> my native accent. My accent. <laughs> yeah. This is this is my accent. Yeah. Okay, so this is uh, like the, the anime and voiceovers and everything. So that's one one of the hustles that you have. Then you do the uh, writing. Have you ever? the acted in theater yeah i started I, I started i kind of went backwards most people are like serious trained theater yeah. actors and then go into <laughs> commercial and television i started in in mm. commercial and and 
corporate stuff and then met a bunch of the acting community and got really in, excited and kind of mm. learned my way in, you know, started doing yeah. smaller productions in France and then doing a lot of stage work. And uh, really like that. I'm very interested in directing mm. for the stage as well. Both my kids are theater majors at university now. Nice. So um, <laughs> very involved in that community now. But mm. yeah, uh, acting for stage is a totally different world and you can get really broken. If you're used to voiceovers where you just have 30 takes to get that one line mm -hmm. right and suddenly you're like, oh, I said it, now it's gone. Okay, that was it. Yeah. That was my one shot. <laughs> yes. um, and, uh, and actually getting to be with the other people in your scenes is kind of great. Because mm. in voiceover, you're all by yourself in the booth recording your yeah. one character, but like being able to play across and so I've, I've done some some tv and some film uh, i've done a fair amount of stage mm -hmm. stuff uh, i have realized i'm a better writer than i am an actor so <laughs> if, if it's my project i did write myself into this project the inside yeah. man and then regretted it because i was <laughs> reading these torturous lines that i wrote and realizing they're terrible and it's too late to fix them <laughs> well are you sure who told you that because i know i don't know about you i'm very hard on myself like when i when i'm watching myself on screen oh, yeah, I hate I everything. Like, oh no like it took so much time for me to get used to seeing myself and hearing myself and just like just Understanding, like this is what my face does when I talk. How why people talk to me at all? Yeah, it's so, brutal. And and for those of you that have never edited a podcast, he's got to sit down and watch all two hours of this thing and stare at his face, and he's gonna hate every minute of it. And I understand <laughs> it. I feel your pain, yeah, even yeah. though you're doing great. Mm -hmm. I know exactly what you mean. You hate everything because yes. you think it's gonna look one way. I, I sent everyone in the group. It was a it was a picture of James Bond, and I said how I think Agent Murphy works, and then it was a picture of Hank Hill from King of the Hills, like how Agent Murphy actually looks. <laughs> But that's that's what I'm trying to ask you. So like you're you saying you're a better writer than actor? Do you, like do you think that you're not a good actor, or there was some actual evidence? <laughs> well, I just I know what I can do, but I also now have been directing and producing long enough mm -hmm. that I know a lot of really talented actors and yeah. I know they can do so much more than I can do. Like I could, I could do a Brandon, Brandon Potter impression and it would be <laughs> passable, but Brandon Potter is going to do so much more with any role. Like I, if, if it's for on camera, you, I would just cast Brandon. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look, come yeah, on, if I'm the actor, I'm going to, I'm going to audition for that part and do my best. But if I'm the producer, I'm like, I'm not hiring Rob McCollum. <laughs> We all have some casting types, even the, like the, the, so some actors who like almost like chameleons who can play anything. We'll still have like, some casting types. So I'm pretty sure that there are roles that you would be much better than Brandon Potter. Yeah. Like middle manager of a retail store, <laughs> low level lawyer. That's, That's me. Well, dad, dad in shopping center. I know my roles. <laughs> What do you prefer? Um, acting on stage, screen, or voice source? I think I love film the most. That's yeah. the most. I mean, I love the acting process of like sitting and figuring it out. Mm -hmm. So I'm one of the few actors that enjoys the rehearsal process mm -hmm. as much as the performance process. I know a lot of actors are like, just get me in front of an audience. I want to do... I want to do eight weeks of this show and find all the things. And I enjoy that. I do feed off an mm -hmm. audience live. Um, but I also love the, the building and the sitting down, doing scene work or figuring out blocking and doing those kind of things. So I think I've always kind of come at it more with a director's eye. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but, but acting for film is, is, is really fun. And then also just improv. I miss improv comedy. I haven't done it in years now, mm -hmm. but that walking onto a stage with no plans and nothing in advance and diving in is super yeah, exciting and I miss scary. it. It's scary, I've never I done miss that. It. Although I think I'm getting too old now. I don't think yeah. I'm as quick as I used to be. I'd, yeah. I'd be terrified to do it now, but yeah. I do miss it. I don't know, I, I never, like, I, I mean, I did some kind of improv classes uh, when I was back in, in uh, I think, City Academy. I'm not sure if we did anything in, in identity school of acting here, but I did some kind of, like, and first of all, language barrier but because sure. I know I know my my English now is much better than it was 10 years ago like because I can communicate I actually have a podcast yeah. in English which can't says a lot imagine <laughs> trying to do improv in your second language yeah. oh my god but it's still like yeah improv like it's still you need to be very quick and I don't think I'm, I'm quite there because sometimes there is a thought and I'm trying to kind of express the thought and then like oh there were and what, you have what's to the translate word? words on oh the fly god. yeah and then you kind of like and my addiction suffers as well very very quickly because When I'm not entirely sure what I'm planning to say, then my mouth is like, well, well, what are we saying? <laughs> what are we doing? So improv is scary. I can imagine, I, I, I can't even imagine doing that in a different 
in a different language than my, I've, I, I guess I tried it in Dutch. I spoke Dutch. Mm. I was an exchange student in Holland for mm. a year. So I spoke Dutch and I think I tried to do some theater and it did yeah. not go well <laughs> when I was over there. That's another, like, why didn't you mention it? Like that you were an exchange student student and you speak Dutch. And yeah, I speak no station based in Netherlands. So I was a long ago. <laughs> it's been a long time, so yeah. I've, 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 I've forgotten it. But I, I was super excited because the owner of No Before, the company that bought us, that mm -hmm. funds all this, mm -hmm. is from Holland. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, this is my chance. I've yeah. been waiting 30 years to finally use this Dutch that nobody, because mm -hmm. it's the most pointless language to speak because everyone in Holland speaks perfect English from the time they're six years old and have really? better diction than I do. Um, <laughs> so. But I was like, this is gonna be my chance. I'm finally gonna, so I finally, when it was time to, you know, we'd seal the deal and I was meeting the owner. I was like, I'm an Aganam Kinistamagen. It was very nice to meet you in perfect Dutch. And he was like, uh-huh. <laughs> Didn't care, was not impressed. No impact whatsoever. <laughs> it's such a shame. Like when, when you actually, like when you got to pull one time. Wow. And then, no. Uh, how was your life in Holland when you like? Uh, I mean, was it the first time when you went to Europe for from? Yeah, it's the first time I'd ever been out of the U.S. I was 17 years yeah. old and just flew. And this was pre cell phones and and mm. emails. So like, I got a call from my mom once every two weeks because mm. it was really expensive. And other than that, you're just like, here you yeah, go, yeah. on your own. So so a lot of times people going to university have the big like struggles of being away from home for the mm -hmm. first time. And by the time I got to university, I was like, this is nothing, I'm in the same country. But it was it was amazing because there was, I didn't know anyone else. There were no other exchange mm -hmm. students in that town. So I was literally just put in this, this small Dutch town and yeah. had to learn the language. So by the end of it, my language skills were pretty good. And because again, an ear for accents and mm -hmm. an ear for dialects, kind of the actor's ear that I've always had, mm -hmm. my, my accent was really good. Yeah. So even in the first couple of sentences, people assume I'm Dutch, mm, nice. but then I only know a very limited vocabulary. Mm. So then they just assume I'm a Dutch idiot, <laughs> 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 but speak very fast at me because they heard what they heard sounded right. And no one from another country speaks Dutch. So if you know a couple of phrases, right, they assume you're Dutch and start going a million miles an hour. Yeah, and I'm yeah. like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> that thing that I said to you is all I know so far. <laughs> Please slow down. Yeah. But uh, what was your impressions when you when you came to like to, to completely different country with different mentality? Like how how was it for you? Well, it was, I mean, you you've had that experience too. But it was At thirty. It was fascinating. Um, the because again, U.S. is such a bubble. Mm -hmm. In Europe, you have so much more awareness of other cultures because you're right next to them. Yeah. But you know. I can drive nine hundred miles and barely hear a detectable change in accent. Like it's. Texas is really big. Arkansas is in the same area. Yeah. Um, so, so realizing, first of all, that getting thrown into that level of diversity and also realizing like, oh, how America sees America and how the world sees America are very different. Very and as a 17 year old, I mean, I thought I was a yeah. citizen of the world and was yeah. fairly liberal in my thinking, but even then realizing like, oh, <laughs> not everything is perceived the same way. And that was in the the George Bush era and just pre Clinton era when, uh, when, you know, we were not necessarily beloved across the globe. So being able to pretend I was Dutch while traveling was also a really good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Cause Americans usually just pretend they're Canadian, but now I could pretend I was Dutch. It was good. Uh, I, I, I Canadian and American very different in terms of how they sound. I mean, like accent is like a, I do. There are like a little bit different. There's a, yeah, there. there's a, a kind of a mid North Midwestern American accent that mm -hmm. you might have heard in Fargo mm -hmm. or some of those. Oh yeah, oh yeah, don't you know? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a, and the Canadian can go that same way. A Canadian is a, is a similar, yeah. a similar. Mostly all of the word choices are similar. It's just got a little bit of a different flow, mm -hmm. and it's got an up glide, mm -hmm. and they uh, they kind of end questions like, or end sentences as if they're a question. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> like oh, you'd like to have some shoes on, yeah? <laughs> and like, are you asking me? Are you telling me? I'm not sure, but they're yeah. they're also just really polite. Yeah, yeah the yeah, Canadians yeah. are just really nice. People. Yeah, but like uh, the, the one thing that. I noticed. I'm not sure. Like you, I, you should know. But uh, right now, like every time when I, like when I'm, for example, I live in London. I live not too far from Heathrow, mm -hmm. and basically when I take two, you can hear American straight away. It's not even necessarily. It's not even like obviously an accent. And, you know, like rolling R's and all this stuff. But like you can hear because they're loud. They're loud. Even even when they speak 
quietly you can it's just like the projection is something it's I dream of projection like that because when I when I did theater like I always had problem with you know being loud enough for projecting the uh, yeah the also it's a lack of situational awareness like the Ameri because again people in European countries are used to traveling around other people that are not like them all the time and you have a a mindset for that. Americans are just used to everything being their territory and they come in just loud. I mean, I get embarrassed on the tube because I'm like, you're talking so loud and you're right there and there's all these people around you and you're oblivious to the fact that everyone is now hearing that Timmy left his socks mm -hmm. on the other, like, no, we, no, we don't need to know that. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a lack of situational awareness that is, uh, uh, hilarious and also embarrassing that my countrymen often, often have. <laughs> and I try, like, I've spent a lot of time over here. I've yeah. shot over here video projects for the last, like I said, 12 years anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And some of them for months and months and months. But even I, like, people will look at me walking down the street and they're like, oh, that's an American. No, and I mean, I'm like, like well, I got good shoes, I got a cool <laughs> shirt, why do you? And they're like, no, it's just something about, they can tell you're an American. No, I mean, there is nothing bad in it, because, like, here is a well, thing, like, uh, no, I mean, yeah. look, I, most. I know you're not saying that, but I, I don't know. That most of the Americans, I'm not necessarily always a, f a huge fan of American, you know, like, politics around the world, but like, if we talk about people, like, I kind of like most of the American people who I met, like, actually very nice people, I like them. Well, and that's, <laughs> someone else said that, like, oh, Americans get such a bad rap, but everyone I've met over here has been so nice. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. yeah, that's because you're meeting the 5% that are traveling internationally <laughs> and have that mindset. If yeah. they're coming over here, they're already, yeah. Uh, different from a lot of the people in the U.S. Even, well, like, I've been to U.S. twice. I've been to, to New York and to L.A. both for, like, a week uh, <clears throat> for work when I still mm -hmm. had a job. <laughs> and, like, again, like, most of the people who I met, like, are were very, very, very nice and polite and just great. I mean, like, I'm not saying that all Americans are like that and every nation there are, like, nice people and there are idiots. So, like, obviously, America is not exclusion, I think. I think some of the, some of the negativity is well-earned. Um, towards the U.S., but I think, you know, people are people. I think you can't you can't say broad things about uh, Any. people from a country across the board. But in general, so look, uh, when you travel be between America and the U.K., like, do you have some kind of adaptation period? Like, when you come here, for example, from America, you're like, oh yeah, I forgot this is how it's done here, and then when you go back, you're like, oh, actually, yeah, I. So I kind of got used to, to the UK a little bit. Yeah, it's mostly just phrases that I use when I've been over here for two mm. months that creep into my <laughs> lingo and then all my friends in the US look at me yeah. strange. My girlfriend's like, what? Yeah. I'll say, I'm gonna nip to the loo. I'm like, what? I'm gonna go to the bathroom? Okay. <laughs> also, we call it a bathroom in the US. Like, we don't want to admit that it's a toilet. Like, I we don't want to say there's a toilet in there. Yeah. We'll call it a bathroom or a restroom. Yeah. Like, we're not resting. No one's really rest. If you're resting in there, it's a problem. <laughs> you should have that checked into. But we, we're afraid to admit that there are bathrooms and the, 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 that that's what's happening in there. But yeah, yeah. It's just a lot, of, a lot of phrases. I mean, America is built around the automobile and it's built around convenience. You can get a 24 hour just about anything. Mm -hmm. The idea that, a, that you can't go to a grocery store at 8 p.m. at night yeah. is unfathomable to the United States. Mm -hmm. um, but so you get you get used to that kind of convenience. But also I just I like I like city living. Dallas is a is a car city. You have to drive mm -hmm. anywhere. If I want to go to the grocery store, I have to get in my car and drive 10 minutes to go to the grocery yeah. store. There's walking, but like big, big cities like New York mm. and, and London yeah. that are walkable cities. I do love that mm. and, and miss that when I go back. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, because for me, when I like, I didn't know this huge difference when I moved to, uh, to the UK from Latvia. I mean, obviously like Latvia and UK, it's different countries, but still like uh, Latvia is kind of, it's, it's been in the Soviet Union, I was born in the Soviet Union, but then it's kind of like more European part of it. And then uh, like it's it kind of it's a part of Europe. Uh, and sure. London is also a multicultural city. So I kind of when I came here, I wasn't that shocked. <laughs> but going to, to the US, what I noticed, like for me, my impressions of, of America was like, American flags are everywhere. They're it's like everywhere. people don't know where they live. <laughs> and then when I kind of like, when I was watching TV, like in between, you know, uh, in the evening, everything is big. Everything is huge. Everything is Michael Bay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I remember with the, 
when the director of Inside Man, and who I've been working with for many years, Jim Shields, who's from mm. here, will come. First of all, like looking at the car dealerships with a giant American flag that's like 40 feet by 70 feet. He's like, what? And the, you know, the beginning of every sporting event, they'll play the national anthem. And he's like, we don't do that. Yeah. He's, both the teams are from America, right? He's like, yeah. I said, but they're still doing it. He's like, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah but it's also like a world championship. The, yeah, it's the, it's the World Series of Baseball, but it's just the United States. Um, but then also, like, it was just an American football, like, normal Sunday match. Mm -hmm. And James, our producer, and, and Jim, the director, were there on a project in Phoenix, and they're watching it, and they're like, there's jet flyovers and flames on the field mm -hmm. and a music yeah. video happening beforehand and all the players and they're like is this the is this the championship is this the finals yeah, i'm like no Tuesday. that's just an average sunday or monday night and they're like this is insane <laughs> then they get all excited to watch the beginning of the american football game because they've never seen a whole game and they're yeah. like all right kick off yeah why is everybody standing around <laughs> Like, oh, well, we stop, and then we do a little bit more, and then we stop again, and then we do a little bit more. And they're used to football where it just is go, go, go yeah, for 45 yeah, minutes. Yeah. yeah, that's not the way American football works. Yeah, I mean, like, I never, I, w I would love to go to America at some point, like, for, for the Super Bowl and just, like, to, to be in the, you know, like, in the room. With oh, people in the stadium. About All of the sporting events yeah. in the stadium is insane. Yeah. It's so much fun. Yeah. Well, the, I mean, you can barely see. You're watching on the Drumbotron because you're so far away from the action, but still you're watching TV with 80,000 other people that are just as excited about it as you are. <laughs> All right, look, let's go back to uh, what we actually were planning to talk about. <laughs> we um, talking about uh, how did you meet Jim Schill? So he was in town. He was doing a lot of corporate events for, for corporate clients, like their big events and their meetings. Um, he would do the videos for that and the projections and the stage direction and the whole thing for like their annual sales conference and that sort of thing. And he was in Dallas doing one of those and my, uh, my ex-wife was in an improv troupe that he went to go see just on a random night that he was bored. And uh, he came to see their show and they happened to pick him out of the audience to interview him and do a rock opera about his life mm -hmm. for their show. And of course he was... Loved that, and uh, they were like, oh, you do corporate stuff. And he's like, yeah, I, I need acts sometimes for corporate stuff. I should get you guys information. And she said, oh, you should meet Rob, because at that point I was handling like their corporate side. I wasn't in that company, but I had been in other improv troops and was handling their corporate event stuff. And he's like, ah, I don't, I'm leaving tomorrow. Mm -hmm. She was like, what time? He's like, two? She's like, come over at 10. So 10 a.m., he's there. We've got a baby in diapers. We're making eggs, and we start talking about his career and my career, and I start pulling up videos that I'd made, and he starts pulling up videos mm -hmm. that he's made. And uh, he asked me if I would, like, pretend to be a producer for their company if they ever had meetings they couldn't make it over here mm -hmm. for, like, for a, just need yeah. a, a quick mop-up or something. And I went to the first meeting and pitched them on an idea that needed to be shot in Dallas mm -hmm. in the next two weeks and called them. And he's like, okay, well, I guess you're not our fake producer. You're a real producer. <laughs> Write it. Get me a cast. Get me a crew. And I'll yeah. be there Tuesday to direct it. And I have written every project for them since for the next 15 years. Nice. And we just realized we were the two two men sharing half of one functioning brain. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I think it's it's uh, it's working. <laughs> did you did you want to direct or write something like for big screen? I would love to do. I mean, my my dream dream opportunity would be to get to do show running for a TV series. Oh. For like a streaming series, mm -hmm. like what we're doing now, but on a full budget with a full with a full episode, mm -hmm. and and be the showrunner. Not even that necessarily writes or directs those episodes, mm -hmm. um, but maybe I would love to do that as well. Mm -hmm. But the showrunner that is making sure that mm -hmm. everything is staying in the same yeah. universe and marshalling that story, even with a team of writers. That mm -hmm. that to me is the ultimate goal mm -hmm. of all the different threads that I have done at various times in my life. Mm -hmm. Kind of yeah. that would be the way to tie them together. Um, that is a that is a, a lofty goal that is kind of far away, but it's one that I that I'm most interested in. And uh, you, you said you you were directing a lot as well. Like what kind of stuff you directed? Directing TV commercials, corporate mm -hmm. stuff, you know, nonprofit mm -hmm. videos, but a lot of a lot of commercials, mm -hmm. um, and and a lot of times just those directing the edits of things that are like put together interviews with people and like how to make that interesting and compelling and yeah yeah, 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 yeah. 
Uh, so again, it's just taking the, the basic rules of storytelling, mm -hmm. but applying them to the corporate thing or the nonprofit thing, but it's kind of the same rule. Like compelling story is compelling story. Mm -hmm. And reminding people, especially people that operate in those boring, what they think of as boring spaces, mm -hmm. is be like, no, you still got stories to tell. Yeah. You just have to not be afraid to tell them. Mm. And to make whatever it is you're trying to get across, make that into a story. If it's a narrative, yeah. it'll be interesting. What, what kind of genre do you, would you want to work in? I mean, I, I, this Inside Man project is the closest to action adventure mm -hmm. that I've ever gotten. And it's all my 12 year old Michael Bay wannabe <laughs> fantasies. So, I mean, getting to blow stuff up, I, I, I think, yeah. yeah. I, I love, I love, you know, because of the hacker space and the information security world we've been in, I think mm -hmm. that that world fascinates me. Mm -hmm. And so getting, but I love comedy too. Mm -hmm. So I, and, and anyone that wants to hire me, I'm game. <laughs> no, I mean, like the, there, I think there's plenty of comedy in, in, in the inside man as well. Uh, I, I would try to really yeah, fight yeah, for yeah, it to keep yeah. it in there. It started way funnier, and <laughs> yeah. then it got as the series as the series got darker and the issues got bigger mm. and more important. It, yeah. There's less and less. But I'm like, no, you yeah. still got to keep that heart. You still have to have some comedic relief, right? Yeah, yeah. you got to you got to release yeah. that tension every once in a while, or people just get exhausted. Uh, so, kind of thriller, drama, comedy. Yeah, sure. Sci-fi. All of those things. Oh, I'd love a sci-fi. <laughs> you kidding? <laughs> Put me on a Star Trek reboot. I'm all for it. What do you think about the the Star Trek new series that they, they have? Like I love ones? world building. I love yeah. all of it. I mean, and, and some of them are uneven, both in the Star Trek and the Star Wars. Some mm -hmm. of them have been. But I just love mm -hmm. that you've said, like, we have this universe. Let's build it out. Let's go find out about that character that we saw in mm -hmm. one scene, one time. That's mm -hmm. learning their backstory. Let's go expand it. And I, I love those ideas of, like, okay, we've created this world. Yeah. There are janitors in this world. Mm -hmm. What is a janitor? Like, there's reality yeah. all around yeah. from all different sides. And, and like, I would love to see a Star Trek episode about an accountant that had nothing to do with any of the shits. But like, someone's got to be processing those. We fixing Enterprise every time when they come back, it just takes too it's much so money. It's so expensive. <laughs> yeah. And someone's got to fill out the paperwork. Like, that was a blaster. Maybe like, as animation as well, it could work. Yeah, I, I think directing animation would be really fun too. But like original, like an original animation project would be really fun to get to go direct because that's a, a totally different skill set because you're not working with actors yet. You're working with artists and, and designers first and building the universe, and then you're working with the actors. I think that'd be a really interesting challenge. Yeah, that would be cool. That would be cool. Maybe there would be you know a place for some Russian guy as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, and um, so now, do do you? Still act now, apart from the inside man. Do you still I'll audition for things. I, I, I got to do a commercial. I did some stage things a couple of years mm -hmm. ago, and uh, I used to try to do a stage play once a year just mm -hmm. to remind myself that I was still an actor. But then COVID happened and kind of shut that down. Oh, um, but uh, but I still still audition for commercials and things, and will put myself up for TV shows. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, again, if they need nerdy attorneys or whatever, I'll put myself in. <laughs> yeah, there's a bunch of there's a bunch of old west stuff that's happening in Texas right now with the Bass Reeves and the 1876 and some of those shows. Mm -hmm. And I like go in and try to be scruffy, and they're like, "You mm -hmm. are not a cowboy, Rob. Wait a second, you are not a cowboy." 1876 because it was it's part of the Yellowstone. When they've gone oh, back through history, I, I there's a 1920s and an 1870s. Yeah. Anyway, a lot of those are shot around Texas, and I've auditioned, and they're like, you do not look like a cowboy, Rob. <laughs> I don't think it's a thing, but because I haven't watched Yellowstone, but I watched 1883. And yeah, I that's the one I was thinking of. Yeah. For me, honestly, I think it's like it's it's a piece of art. I love it. Like I think it's one of the best series. Bass Reeves is the new one that's just come out yeah. that is supposedly, I haven't yet watched it, but it's mm -hmm. supposedly really, really, in the, very much the same as 1883. Yeah, because 1883, I loved it so much there were like few scenes that, like i think about it I, i'm starting crying <laughs> so yeah it was it was great were there any projects on, like an anime when you were dubbing them that you kind of like you started working on them and then you got sucked in so much that you're like i'm gonna watch oh this absolutely yeah. yeah there's been a bunch i mean attack on titan was one of them but there's a show called psychopaths that i thought was great and i was like i would watch this if i had no connection to it at all i would still think this is one of the coolest things yeah but people are like do you watch tons of anime and i'm like no, because it's kind of work. Yeah. Like, it's like a guy who works in a pizza place is not going to make pizza when he gets home. It kind of feels like work. And also, I can't disconnect from the process. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm listening to the acting and thinking like, oh, I know that person. Or, mm -hmm. oh, they did that. Or, they made this choice. And I'm not 
totally connected with the story. Mm. Um, so if I do watch it, I usually watch the original Japanese with the subtitles because at least that's uh, one yeah, step yeah, removed yeah. from my part of the thing. Yeah. But can, can you, like, as a writer, do you analyze what you're watching a lot? Like, so when you're watching some films and series, like, Absolutely. do you kind of analyze it or you can just switch it off and just like relax brain and just enjoy it? That's, it? that's how I know something's really good. Yeah. If it's really good, my, my analytic, analytical brain shuts down mm -hmm. and I'm along for the ride. Yeah. If it's, if it's not that tier, and there's things that I still enjoy, but I'm looking at the camera angles, I'm thinking about mm -hmm. the writing, I'm thinking about the, the, you know, oh, they had a steady cam for this shot and went mm -hmm. around the corner on it. If it's something that's really fantastic, yeah. I, will, I will just watch it and be in. Like there's a show called The Diplomat, which is a Netflix series that I absolutely loved. It's about a, the, uh, not the, is it The Diplomat? Yeah, The Diplomat. Mm -hmm. It's about the American uh, ambassador to London. Mm -hmm. um, season one just came out. It's fantastic. And it was so much like, this is exactly what I would dream to write. It's like mm -hmm. Aaron Sorkin wrote political drama, but put a little spy th twist <laughs> on it. It's like a spy twist yeah, on the yeah, West yeah, Wing. Yeah. Great dialogue, super poppy, exactly the kind of thing I wished I would write and wished mm -hmm. I could work on. But while I was watching it, I was just totally engaged. Yeah. I wasn't analyzing anything. That's how I know something's really good. This is the fact you're writing. Because uh, like I did write a little bit uh, in English. And I know it wasn't terrible. Some things like you need fixing. But like I noticed that at some point I was watching what was the newsroom. Mm -hmm. And I kind of also were, was writing something at the same, same time. I was writing the series comedy series about actors and I noticed at some point like that actually I do kind of my writing changed because I was watching the newsroom because the circus dialogue is like it's just like it's unreal like like people slightly very high very yeah. smart very quick very witty and like no one is like that and if someone is but like it's not everyone in the room yeah <laughs> it's know? like all the smartest people you've ever met are hanging out at the same <laughs> yeah, time yeah. and they're just like just so quick and smart and like and I kind of st like obviously I didn't write as Sorkin but I just noticed like unintentionally does, you started picking does it up does affect yeah. how, how I write does this happen to you as well absolutely like you can even look because this project has been going on now for this is the sixth year or mm -hmm. really seventh year since we started working on it um, you can kind of I can at least go back and tell mm -hmm. What I was watching yeah. when I was writing that season, like, oh, this is definitely a Killing a Eve. <laughs> this was the one where I was watching Killing Eve. Yeah. This was the one where I was watching this. This is yeah. the one where I was influenced. So I can definitely tell, like, what, what mo Oh, I watched Barry. Yeah. This, there's a lot of Barryisms in this season yeah. and things like that. Um, but, it, but, and again, it's not that you're consciously trying to rip it off. It's mm -hmm. just that's no, of course, that's the, the the water you're swimming in at that moment. So of course, yeah. it affects you, and you it's get a, it's inspiration. I think you're being inspired by something is very good. Like maybe you can even use it strategic strategically. Maybe you can think like, oh, you know what? The next season, I want it to be like very kind of you know spy driven. I got to watch. The other water, thing like, that happens. The other thing that happens is this: is that I will write things into the script of the the storyline and think this is going to be perfect. This is going to be great. <laughs> And then like a month later, I'll see almost that exact same thing on another series and be like, oh, I have to change it now because it's going to look like I ripped that off. But I wrote it first, but it's too late. It's already in there. <laughs> so it happens. Um, about your process, how, like, how do you write? Like, what's, like, do you have like a page count a day? Like, or, or Nothing that involved. A real, a real grown-up writer would do all of those things. Yeah. I do very little. A lot of times it is, it is based on the deadline and working mm -hmm. back. And I also find that I have to talk it out first. Mm -hmm. So whether that's with a writing partner or whether that's on the phone with the director, Jim, I, if, if I just talk through it mm -hmm. and pace and brainstorm, mm -hmm. I can get it all out and then I can go sit down and write it. But if I just sit at the screen and look at the blank screen, it doesn't happen. But if I get on my feet and move and talk it out, mm -hmm. I can usually get a structure in my head and then go and start to piece it together. So I'll put little pockets of scenes think of those scenes, mm -hmm. think of moments, and then I start putting the moments in order. Mm -hmm. But those moments don't come from looking at the screen, they come from talking it out with somebody. Yeah. So I have to have some kind of a writing partner. And so either it's late at night for me and early in the morning for mm -hmm. Jim, or vice versa, because we're six hours difference, yeah. and, uh, and that's how we work most of it out. And, yeah. and really for almost anything I've written, it's been that same way. I've had to have somebody to bounce it off of first out loud. Mm -hmm. So, like, do you use like like some kind of cards when you when you? Yeah, you I've got them. now. I've got a, a magnetic dry erase board mm -hmm. that you can put things up and move them around mm -hmm. like little, just erasable 
but yeah. you can take them and move the magnets off mm -hmm. and move them around. And so, yeah, for any big writing project, that just lives in my dining room. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you work first. You work on like on the basically on the skeleton of the story, and then you kind of start writing scenes. Yeah, it, it, <clears throat> usually the other way around. Mm -hmm. It'll start with scene ideas. Mm -hmm. Like this would be a cool scene. This would be a cool scene. This would be a cool scene. Mm -hmm. What is the objective we're going towards? We'll try to work out like this is this this is all building towards this. Mm -hmm. We don't know how we're going to get there, and then we have these different islands of scenes, yeah. and then we start lighting them up and like oh well this one could go if this happened first that would affect okay that and, and you start working the map out. But it starts off with just like. Things we'd like to see. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be cool if this happened and this happened? Wouldn't it be cool if these two people were in this kind of environment? Wouldn't it be cool if they were on a subway and this happened? And then mm -hmm. we start seeing if there's a way to use that. Yeah. All right. And then how many rewrites do you have? Oh, seven million. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Up until the day we're shooting. Oh, really? Like, you, you, your lines will change today because I'll go, you know what? That sounds terrible. Say it this way. Um, not because you're delivering your bad, but because we realize the problem. Yeah. But yeah, constantly be, be rewriting and don't be precious about anything. That's the other thing is like just, I learned that from Steve Walters is a writer that I worked with and, uh, and worked for at different times. And he is the, he'll spend all night up until mm -hmm. three in the morning working on a specific scene and come in the next morning and say, no, I'm sorry to throw that away. Mm -hmm. We're doing something else. Mm -hmm. And he could spend three days trying to protect it and defend it because it was so hard to do and he took so much time to do it. He's like, no, it doesn't work. Kill it. Mm -hmm. um, and then bring it back if it needs to later. But yeah. don't be precious at all yeah. about it, about any of it because you'll, you'll get in the way. You'll start protecting things that are getting in the way of better things. Yeah. If you go, anything, is, anything on this table is killable. Yeah. Any one of these can go away if I don't need it anymore. How long did it take you to realize that? Like, uh, it to, took to, a long to, time. To, to accept that. Because yeah. I know how hard it is, like, and I don't have all your experience. But when I've written something, there are like things that I like, I'm so precious about it. I love this dialogue. I can't remove it. What do you mean? What do you mean remove it? Like, it's so great. <laughs> the, it, it, it comes from trust. And actually, Steve Walters, the same person I mentioned before, is the one that said trust yourself to fill the void. Because mm -hmm. you're like, I don't want to throw this away because this is here and it's, it's holding this place and it's already done. Mm. And if I threw it out, there would be a void there. Mm. And that's scary. And you're like, no, just trust. If you have an idea that you had an idea for that one, you'll have an idea for that one. Mm -hmm. Trust future you to fill that in. Same way with like, oh, this would be really cool and this would be a good ending of this episode. Mm. But it actually kind of works as the second scene. Mm -hmm. Well, trust you'll find another cool end of the episode. Put it as a second. Don't just pad, yeah. pad out and tread water to get to the big finish. No, put it second. Mm -hmm. If that's your episode two, figure out your episode six. If mm -hmm. that, if if you think this is your episode twelve season finale, what happens if you put that at the halfway point? And then you have to fill something else out. But you might find something even better and even cooler. So, yeah. it's it's mostly yeah, it's confidence of trusting yourself to fill that void. All right, and what would be your advice for people who want to write? Uh, well, quick step by step, what they should do right now. Write something terrible. What if they can't write so now? Maybe, maybe. No, <laughs> what I'm saying is don't wait till a good idea. Don't wait till the right idea. Don't wait till the opportunity comes. Mm. And don't wait till like, I can't write it yet because it's not good. Write something bad mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. Sit down, start writing it. Mm -hmm. If it's a, is it a book, is it a screenplay, is it a novel? I don't know. Start writing it and write something terrible and then go back to it and go, okay, is that terrible? Is there something good for that? Write something else. Because we put so much pressure to know that it's going to be okay that you don't want to start. So just start mm -hmm. and start with the goal of like, I'm going to write something bad. I'm going to write two bad, bad pages right now. And the bad way of saying this is, I don't know what the dialogue is. This is what I need to have to happen. The bad way of saying that is, hey, look over there. I don't want to. Why not? Because, and write the bad version. Mm -hmm. And then you can look at it and go, why is that bad? How can I fix it? But if you wait till you have those answers to start writing, you'll never start writing. Mm -hmm. Write a bad version. All right. And then, well, maybe, well, at some point you will need to find someone who will show you what's not good at what you wrote because sometimes you don't understand. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah. But even even writing it, you're like you said, we're our own worst critics. Mm. And and we, that critic can prevent us from writing or that critic can go back and look at it and say what needs to improve. You mm. you may know more than you think. It's just 
going in and just get some version out of it and then go back. And then again, having a second set of eyes mm -hmm. is really useful. Reading it out loud is also really mm -hmm. useful. Reading in general is very useful if you want to write. It's true. <laughs> watch, watch things and look at it with the writer's eye. Like, why did they make this choice here? As a, you really watch it once and get on the involved in the story, but then go back and say, okay, what information did they drop here? What information did they drop here? I mean, you can pay for a screenwriting class, but you can also just watch a whole bunch of good movies on Netflix, mm -hmm. which is a screenwriting class, yeah. if you analyze it and, and, and take the time to go like, okay, this happened at around this time, this happened at the halfway point, this happened in the last third, this is a three-act structure. You don't have to have a class about a three-act structure. You're like, oh, most of the most of the movies I've seen have something that starts in the middle and then a kind of, or at the start, a change in the middle and then a resolution at the end. That is film stool. Mm -hmm. If you just turn your brain towards like, let's start thinking of those choices. Mm -hmm. Keep watching and keep, keep reading. Nice. Look, I obviously would have more questions, but because we are almost out of time, uh, very quick blitz round, quick uh, questions, quick answers. Quick answer, speed round, ready. Yeah, yeah. Texting or talking? Texting. Cats or dogs? I own a cat. Okay. Your one guilty pleasure? Oh, french fries. Nice. Uh, what makes you laugh? What makes me laugh? Lots of things, man. There was such, such a broad question. Did you see him shut me down? <laughs> I got shut down because there were so many, <laughs> there's so many things. Um, genuine, unironic enthusiasm. All right. <laughs> <laughs> like like SpongeBob or Ted Lasso, I'm, I I love I love oh. people that are un, un, unapologetically super into the thing that they yeah. are into. Oh, I hate awesome. irony. I love I love unironic expressions of joy. All right, nice. Uh, what makes you angry? Um, uh, injustice. Yeah. In, in, in across the board. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any nicknames? Not really. But not really. All right. All right. The that's, world's that's greatest it. filmmaker? <laughs> that's right. not actually anything I even have, but I would love to start that here. So if you just spread that around, that'd be great. What dish do you cook best? Which, which dish do yeah. I cook best? I do a, a, a fairly good salmon stir fry, mm -hmm. salmon and edamame stir fry, um, and I do a mean brisket. I mean, I am from Texas. I smoke. I never tried it. Smoke it for you. Smoke it for twelve hours. You smoke it for four hours, and then you cook it for twelve to sixteen hours. Uh, one day I'll come apart. over. It's you'll, so good. You'll, you'll feed I will me. make you a mean brisket, <laughs> my friend. Uh, your favorite character in any fictional storybook, uh, anime, screen, video game? Wow, favorite character of all, of all time. These are hard questions, Andre. Um. um I really like the Scarlet Pimpernel from the book, The Scarlet Pimpernel and the series based by Baroness Orsese. Mm -hmm. Scarlet Pimpernel was kind of like the first Batman, but mm. I really like him. I like, I like the Three Musketeers, like mm. that time period. Nice. But yeah, I'm gonna say Scarlet Pimpernel. All right, uh, Star Wars or The Lord of the Rings? <sighs> I loved The Lord of the Rings. It's kind of what made me want to become a filmmaker, but Star Wars was my seven-year-old life mm -hmm. and my bedroom for about six years and right. the action figures, so it has to be Star Wars. Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Wars again. Love Star Trek, Star Wars still. Uh, any unexpected talents? I have no talent at all. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I will, we don't have time to, we don't have time to argue. Uh, how often do you cry? Often. And if I'm tired, it can happen even during like commercials, mm -hmm. a well like, and any musical theater thing. If I'm in in a, in a place in a dark theater and someone's singing, I'm probably tearing up, even if it's bad or nice. not even a, not even an impactful song. Mm -hmm. If they're singing, I'm probably crying. All right. And the very last question: How can people reach you if they want to work with you? Reaching me if they want to work with me. I, Instagram is always a good way. Um, I am at Rob H McCollum, and uh, and. And yeah, I don't have any time. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, look, thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time out of busy schedule. We will meet soon very, because my call time is at five. Your call time is now. Uh, we'll definitely meet on set. Uh, I will be saying lines that you wrote on camera today. If you like that, please subscribe, please like, or don't. Like the video. Click on the yeah. thing. Yes, yeah, subscribe. Click. It's right. It's yeah. It's right down there. Yeah. Click on it. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Look, thanks. Bye, guys. Bye.